I would do less. I don't need a lot coming. You can bring a little voice down, too much. Article at. At. That's it. Of course, a word that doesn't really mean anything. Yomer is a good follow up. Shasha? I know. Oops, you're throwing tough luck, man. How was day one? No, no, no. How dare you? <laughs> They're good. They're like busy. Grant 
son's great granddaughter. They're 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 both just terrific. And uh, we're just busy, which is a good thing. You know, I have I have grown children who are dutifully employed or studying. So that's all I gotta ask for. I could ask for more, but uh, I'll stay with that. Good to see you, Shana Tava. That you're with us always. It's so calm this morning. It's so nice to feel that calmness that liturgically is supposed to go along with the new year. You know, it's not supposed to be the kind of uh, big Sukkot exuberance. It's just supposed to be this. <sighs> and Part of that sigh of comfort is a sigh of gratitude. As Susan just sang, it's really about being thankful for the simplest things. And, and every person in the sanctuary can point to something or some things for which you are deeply grateful. And for some of you, they're really big things. They're really big things, like surviving an illness or seeing a friend or relative through an illness. And for some of you, it's about a, a big moment in your lives, in your professions, that you've achieved another uh, degree of success and acceptance. And that's a, a huge thing. That's really all about being grateful for that. And Onward. I mean, there are really so many things that you got a chance to see somebody in concert. There's gratitude in that, too. So many things. Today, on this second day of a new year, the first day of fall, and I appreciate that the Holy One gave us the appropriate weather to kind of connect it. Of course, in two days, it's going to be 86 degrees. But in the meantime, this is nice. This is part of the calmness of entering into the new year. And I would have to say on a certain level that the, the thing that is most in my mind about feeling gratitude is uh, you. It's that you're here on this second day which in, on the reform calendar is definitely in parentheses. There are reform synagogues that are open, business offices open today, and it's a regular day. But the roots of this congregation were roots uh, of the founders, roots were in the conservative movement. And though they were happy and ready to move into a more progressive kind of theology and liturgy, there was something that they, there were certain things they did not want to uh, depart from, and one of them was a second day of Rosh Hashanah. And I'm, 
I'm really glad about that because the second day gives us the opportunity to let it sink in a little bit more, just what this means, this, this new year. And I hope that you connect to that and use this time. Obviously, you're here or it wouldn't be that way for you. And as I said, it is my sense of gratitude that all of us are here to celebrate, to pray, to form this collective. As I look out at the congregation, you're an amazingly wonderful smattering of different people from different perspectives. And it may be that you don't all know each other, and we're not going to go around the room, uh, but what I'd like to suggest, if you please turn to your left and right, in front of you and behind you, please say, Shana Tava, my name is, I'm from, I'm here, I'm there. A lot of Yes, it's very sweet. One of the uh, really, and I watched it on streaming, uh, yes, not the whole thing. I, I, I wanted to watch the Talises go on because that for me is always such a, uh, I guess there's something very special about that image. Um, it's about how we begin together, how we envelop ourselves in this holy moment. So if you are wearing a Talis this morning, if you'd please rise. Ribono Shalom, creator of the universe, on this second day of the new year, we are grateful for you, for your presence in our lives. Holy One, keep our hearts open to you. Help us to remember your presence in our lives. Give us courage, give us resilience, give us an open heart, give us the chance to make right and to do good. Help us to follow a path of righteousness, a path that is all our own. Let us extend ourselves to those around us in love, in peace, in shalom. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav Itzivanu Lihita Tev Batzitzit. Page 110. Here in this place of prayer and song, hear the call that stirs the soul. All may enter, let none stand apart. Sisters and brothers, how beautiful and how good. On page 122. Hello, hi, hello, hi,
Statistically, the probability of any one of us being here is so small that you'd think the mere fact of existing would keep us all in a contented dazzlement of surprise. We are all alive against the stupendous odds of genetics, infinitely outnumbered by all the alternates who might, except for luck, be in our places. Even more astounding is our statistical improbability in physical terms. The normal predictable state of matter throughout the universe is randomness, a relaxed sort of equilibrium with atoms and their particles scattered around in an amorphous muddle. We, in brilliant contrast, are completely organized structures squirming with information at every covalent bond. Add to this the biological improbability that makes each member of our own species unique. Each of us is a self-contained, freestanding individual labeled by specific protein configurations at the surface of cells, identifiable by whorls of fingertip skin, maybe even by special medleys of fragrance. You'd think we'd never stop dancing. motifs of our service. It's that melody that we know if we've been, even if you're a twice a year Jew for decades, you still know da 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 da. Like that is, that pushes the button and we are just slammed back into the space of High Holy Days. It's remarkable how that particular melody line sticks with us and puts us in a very different place. It's the extraordinary combination of music and memory and neshama and soul, all that combines together to create this kind of uh, pathway for us to find, even though it's a brand new year of the unknown, at least we have some familiar tools to work with as we navigate. 
And I think that melody becomes really our, it's our background music, as it were, through Yom Kippur. And I hope as we sing it a few times in the course of our service this morning, that it will resonate for you in a strong and powerful way. And as I said yesterday, and I feel like I need to say this at every service, probably should say it at every Shabbat service, the, the machzor, the, the, the prayer book that we use, and, and this is kind of, a, I really like this prayer book, um, which I don't think I've said a, about a prayer book in years. I really do like this prayer book, and um, I, I, but I don't want anyone to feel confined by it. If you tend not to be a prayer book person, though if you're here on the second day, you tend to be probably a little more comfortable in here, but if, if a prayer book is an impediment, an obstacle, rather than an aid in going into the new year. If it causes too much dissonance for you, if you open it and read and go, I don't believe that, and then don't use the book. Then just sit, absorb the music, and absorb sort of the group consciousness that's roiling about in the sanctuary, and use that, embrace that. Inhale that and let that be part of the new year for you. Because this is a space for every one of you to use as you want. When I ask you to rise as you are able, you'll rise or not. And even if you are able but don't want to, that's okay too. You can rebel in here if you want. All the things you want to do when you were a kid in school, but maybe you, were, I mean, you can't start yelling and throwing stuff. But <laughs> I guess the point is at this stage, I talked about Judaism 2.0 yesterday, and a part of that, I think, is to be realistic about that which we embrace, and that if we don't, if we don't make it relevant by embracing it and understanding it through our own lenses, not through what someone else's expectations are, then it will lose meaning. And over the few decades, I think that has been an unfortunate part of this relationship to prayer. So what I'm suggesting is there's so much that is so good in the prayer book and we invite you to pray with us throughout the day and if it's an impediment, put it down back and forth into it, use it for use the time for meditation, contemplation. But on the second day, this time is your time and how we share it together is all about what comes from your heart and what goes to your heart. So if you'll please rise as you are able for the Baruch Hu on page 142. Together on page 142, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam, Yotzer Or Uvarei Choshech, Osei Shalom Uvarei. To the next page, Hameir La Aretz Veladarim Aleha Berachamim, Uftuvo Mechadesh Bechal Yom Tamid Maasei Breishit, Ma Rabu Maasecha Adonai, Kulam Bechochma Asita, Malah Aretz Kinyanecha, Tit Barach Adonai Eloheinu. Al shevach maasei adecha, v'al meore or sheasita yifa arucha sela, or chadash al tzion ta'ir, v'nizke chulano mehera le'oro. Baruch ata Adonai, yotze ha'me'orot.
There's never a greater sense of the masses than uh, when um, you come to Rosh Hashanah Day services. You know, the, the, the notion of being around that many Jews, it, it, we don't normally have that experience. Uh, so when we do, it feels kind of kind of wild and crazy, you know? It feels very, uh, it's exciting, you know? It's exciting to see everybody gather again. And I just imagine that moment, you know, at the Sea of Reeds, right? There's this image in our sacred tradition that we're all gathered there, just 600,000, who knows, a million point two, just all just clumped together. And we're all standing at the very edge of the Red Sea, and, and, and the, the bad guys are on the way, and we've got only one direction to go, which is straight ahead. Unfortunately, straight ahead means going into the waters, and there's nothing but fear there. And truth be told, sometimes when it's time to move forward, there's enormous fear, leaving what was to what is unknown. Even when what was is uncomfortable and horrible, the notion of going into something new has its own unique valence, right? its own unique degree of fear and anxiety. There are some people that love that. They love the thrill of the unknown, and they bungee jump and skateboard off of mountains or whatever they do. Um, but uh, for many of us, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's unpredictable. It's frightening. And again, what is the, what is the quintessential truth that enables us to actually make that leap, that step forward, is to know that we're not alone by making that step. We're not just doing it on our own. If we look to our left, someone's stepping off with us. To the right, yep, there's behind us, someone's going, I'm, I'm right with you. And you can feel the hand of that person on your shoulder. That makes this bearable. It does. It, it, it doesn't make it less frightening, but you feel like, well, at least I'm not the only one. And there's an extraordinary comfort in that phrase. At least I'm not the and as a member of this congregation, as a member of this tribe we call the Jewish people, that's what it means, first and foremost. There's someone there with you. There's someone there helping us understand and navigate the tradition and the world in the day, every single day. And on this new year, how especially important to know that, to feel that, to 
acknowledge that we're in this together. We're on page 164. <coughs> <laughs> Turn to page 166 and rise for the tefillah. Baruch <laughs> 
ישלב ומי יתייסר, מי יעני ומי יעשיר, מי יושפל ומי ירום. בראש השנה יקטבון, יקטבון. We read the English together on page 178. On Rosh Hashanah, this is written. On the fast of Yom Kippur, this is sealed. How many will pass away from this world? How many will be <coughs> born into it? Who will live and who will die? Who will reach the ripeness of age? Who will be taken before their time? Who by fire and who by water? Who by war and who by beast? who by famine and who by drought, who by earthquake and who by plague, who by strangling and who by stoning, who will rest and who will wander, who will be tranquil and who will be troubled, who will be calm and who tormented, who will live in poverty and who in prosperity, who will be humbled, who exalted. But through return to the right path, through prayer and righteous giving, we can the harshness of, of the, the decree. Uchuba Uchvila Uchida silently. <coughs> you may be seated.
If you will, please turn to page 200. One of the things about our prayer book that I was, I'll acknowledge, not happy about was the way they sliced up the, uh, the shofar service in a way that is not uh, traditional, which as Reformed Jews were allowed to mess with it like that. And uh, we did it, la and I was skeptical, but we used it last year on the second day. It actually felt um, comfortable. So we're going to try it again. And after the service, I'd love for you to tell me just what it feels like for you on a second day. Uh, if, it, if you feel it's too chopped up or if you feel like there's something about the placement of the different shofar services that enables us to uh, find what we're looking for when we hear the shofar. And I do believe our Baal shofar is Zach. Oh, good. I didn't see you first. I wanted to make sure you were here. Otherwise, I was on duty. So, Zach, you come on down. Uh, with the shofar, yeah. Uh, and folks, if you'll please read with me on page 200. We are stiff-necked and stubborn. Teach us to bend before you. Convinced we're right, entrenched in our own perspective, we resist your call to repent. Convinced we're self-sufficient, entrenched in the illusion of control, we resist your call to humility. Convinced we can have it all, entrenched in the dream of mastering the world, we resist your call to wake up. Today you summon us out of our arrogance, out of rigidity, fantasy, shallowness, self-deception. Teach us to bend our knees, to bow our heads before the mystery, to realize our frailty and our finitude. Teach us to make you melech, sovereign in our lives, to align ourselves with your goodness and truth. We would not bow before Pharaoh. We would not bow before the Persian Lord. We would not submit to any power on earth or give ourselves to any material thing. But we, the Jewish people, stiff-necked, stubborn to the end, today we bow before you. Please rise. Our blessing is on page 206. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher kichanu b'mitzvotav V'tzivanu lishmo akol shofar Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Shehechianu v'kiyamanu
Shivarim Teruwa. Tekiya. Tekiya. Shivarim. Tekiya. Tekiya. Teruwa. Tekiya. got so into it. I know, we were so into it. Folks, we're on page 223. We read together. Avinu Malkenu, almighty and merciful, hear our voice. Avinu Malkenu, we have strayed and sinned before you. Avinu Malkenu, have compassion on us and in our families. Avinu Malkenu, halt the onslaught of sickness, violence, and hunger. Avinu Malkenu, halt the reign of those who cause pain and terror. Avinu Malkenu, enter our names in the book of lives well lived. Avinu Malkenu, renew us for a year of goodness. Avinu Malkenu, Almighty and merciful, answer us with grace, for our deeds are wanting. Save us through acts of justice and love. Oh, 
to invite to the Bima our Torah readers for this second day of Rosh Hashanah. There should be seven of yes. six of you actually. Hazel and Carol, One, Merle, Robin, two, Shuki. Three, four, I'm nine. number seven. I think we're good. On the top of page 227. In <laughs> Adonai, Adonai, God, compassionate, gracious, endlessly patient, loving, and true, showing mercy to the thousandth generation, forgiving evil, defiance, and wrongdoing, granting pardon. <laughs> Lula, no. 
Adonaiti, ulirom lema shemo yachtav. be seated. Well, you might be wondering, it came to me that for many, many years, the Holocaust Torah, which we traditionally have taken out before Yisker, and we walk into the room with it, and it really is for many people a focal point, and for them actually, for many people, it's a focal point of sadness, of mourning, of loss. And, um, And I was really thinking about this this past year, and I, I thought it didn't feel right to me. I mean, I, I love that ceremony, and we will continue to do it, don't worry. But I, um, but I thought it, it was an incomplete gesture to this Holocaust Torah, that its importance as a key to unlocking sadness and memory and loss, that all makes sense to me. And that's why we use it that way. But it's also, a, it's a Torah. And I, I thought that, you know, it's like the, uh, the psalm that we recite for our, the Birkat Hamazon. You know, we, we um, sow in sadness and reap in laughter. And I thought that there needed to be a dynamic living element for this Torah. And in fact, we got a directive from the Westminster Synagogue Authority, very British, who um, uh, uh, is in charge of all of, this is a Torah essentially on uh, eternal loan uh, from uh, the organization that saved uh, hundreds if not thousands of Torahs that the Nazis uh, stole from synagogues they later destroyed with the idea that there would one day be a big museum 
uh, remembering who the Jewish people were, and they would have all these objects that they took uh, from this now vanquished, extinct people. Uh, of course, the joke was on Hitler, but uh, the, the fact is that here we are with one of those Torahs, and the idea was that as many synagogues as wanted could have on loan one of those Torahs. And like mo most other places, we put ours in a special case with a memorial plaque. And then I'm not sure whose idea it was, along with Rabbi Miller, who began to use the Torah uh, on uh, Yisker, on Yom Kippur afternoon. But the directive was uh, from a new, a, a new guy, you know, comes in, and he says, you know, we've, we, we realize that a Sefer Torah, if you just let it sit, and you don't do anything with it other than to let it sit, it will begin to fall apart. That it's one of those things, ironically, that needs, it needs air. It literally needs air. Now, not too much, otherwise it disintegrates. But it needs to somehow be moved, used. Otherwise, it gets brittle and will fall apart. And so, um, I thought in talking about this sense of Judaism at another stage that our Judaism, I called it Judaism 2.0. I got an email from someone that said, I think there are more, le I think it should be like 9.0. Like, we've had lots, and I, you know, so that's, I, I appreciate that detail. I wasn't counting levels. I was sort of more using our, our parlance of when we're starting a new project. But yes, there have been several stages, and if, I felt like at this stage of where we are, as our survivors are becoming fewer and fewer, that their stories become more and more important. I've often said that if, if I were king of the Jews, I would require every Jewish person alive to pick one name, just one name. You don't have to be related. You don't even have to know their story. Just pick a name, and that name becomes your responsibility. And then when you get older, you pass that name on to your kids. But somehow, no matter what, that name gets somehow included in your family because there's no one to remember this person. But they, they were somebody. They had family. They had connections. They were related to us. And in that way, we figure out a better way to keep them alive. The loss we never forget what that feels like to acknowledge loss, but also to acknowledge the, the beauty of that person's life, who they were, what they did. So I thought, what better way to acknowledge the Westminster's directive than to take out this Torah on the second day of Rosh Hashanah and read what from it? Breshit. The, in the beginning, right? In other words, this every day is a new beginning. Uh, one of our great Hasidic masters, uh, the Buddha Chifar Rabbi, said, every morning is Breshit. And he didn't just mean that like every morning, it's a new morning. We get that, the rascals saying about it. But the, the here, when we say, we talk about, when he says every day is Breshit, he literally means each day is the first day of creation. What are you going to do in it? And that's a wonderful and abiding question to ask every day. So uh, I'm going to invite first uh, our uh, seven readers that come up, representing each day of the week. I would then, yes, get in line, please, according to your Aliyot. And then what I'd like to do is invite you, uh, should you so choose, to come and uh, look at this Torah close up. Many of you have only seen this Torah behind glass, or you've touched it as it's walked, been walked through during uh, Yisker. So if you'd like to see it, please uh, come closer, then we'll have a group of Leah. Come on up.
Yes, apparently we actually know what synagogue it, it came from. Um, and the name of the town, there's a few other uh, synagogues that have Torahs from the same basic location. Ayad, right here. And uh, if you look, I mean, the, the, the truth is there might be some um, letters that are less clear, but as long as you can recognize the letter, then it's still a kosher, it's still a kosher Torah. Well, I haven't gone over every letter yet, uh, but at least for uh, right now, for Bray Sheet, it looks kosher to me. So, um, folks, uh, if everybody, uh, everyone has an eye view, uh, if you might want to come around this way and stand on the step to get a closer, well, it's probably not a, is that, is that you can still see it that way? Come on up, come on around, and uh, let us all uh, bless the Torah. One, two, three. Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvorach, Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Leolam Vaed, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Ha'amim, V'natan Lanu et Torato. Baruch Ata Adonai, Noten Torah. Amen. And of course I left my book on the Bima. So can someone, right, good, but I'm looking for people to follow along. Would you find uh, the Breshi Torah reading, please? And just so you know, we have seven new readers this year and we're Page reading it all at once. So we're just going to keep jumping into space, okay, into place like we did, uh, as we have done in the past. One big aliyah. What page? We don't know All yet. Right. Page 330, that was? 330. And? I'm leading off. Wow, this is really special. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim ve-et ha-aretz ve-ha-aretz ha-ta tohu vavohu ve-choshech al p'nei tahom Veruach Elohim merachefet al p'nei ha-mayim Vayomer Elohim yehi or vayhi or Vayar Elohim et ha-or ki tov Vayavdel Elohim bein ha-or uvein ha-choshech Vayikra Elohim leor yahum velachoshech karalayla vayere vayiboker yom echad. Elohim, et harakia, vayavdel, bein hamayim, asher mitachat larakia, uvein hamayim, asher meal larakia, vayichem, vayikra Elohim, larakia, shamayim, Vayomer Elohim Hikavu Hamayim מתחת השמיים מר מקום אחד ותראה היבשה ויכהן ויקרא אלוהים ויקרא אלוהים ליבשה ארץ ולמקווה המים קרא הימים וירא אלוהים כי טוב, ויאמר אלוהים, תדשא הארץ 
דשא, עשב מזריע זרע, עץ פרי, עושה פרי למינו, אשר זרעו בו על הארץ, ויחן. ותוצא הארץ דשא, עשב מזריע זרע למינהו, ועץ עושה פרי, אשר זרעו בו למינהו, וירע אלוהים כי טוב, וירע ויבוקר יום שלישי. That's what happened when you skip the line. <laughs> <laughs> You're just making your students feel good. Yes, yeah, you know. Yeah. 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 It was very That's nice of you. Human, right? <laughs> <laughs> I my own. That's what happened. Okay. Okay. Vayom Elohim yehi me'orot b'yerkia ha'shamayim le'havdil ben ha'yom u'ven ha'layla ve'hayu le'otot u'mo'adim u'yamim v'shanim ve'hayu le'morot ברכייה השמיים להעיר על הארץ ויחן. ויעס אלוהים את שני המורות הגדולים, את המאור הגדול לממשל את היום, ואת המאור הקטון לממשל את הלילה, ואת הכוכבים. וייתן אותם אלוהים ברכי השמיים להעיר על הארץ ולמשול ביום ובלילה ולהבדיל בין האור ובין החושך וירא אלוהים כי טוב ויהי ערב ויהי בוקר יום רביעי אמן, ויאמר אלוהים יצרעו המים שרך נפש היה, ועוף יופף על הארץ על פני רקיע השמיים. ויברא אלוהים את התננים הגדולים, ואת כל נפש החיה הרומסת אשר שרצו המים למיניכם. ועד כה עוב כנף למינהו, וירע אלוהים כי טוב. ויברך אותם אלוהים לאמור, פרעו אורבו, ומילאו את המים הפיימים, ועוף ירע בארץ. וירע ויבוקר יום חמישי. ויאמר אלוהים, תוצא הארץ נפש חיה למינה, בהמה ורמס וחייתו ארץ למינה, ויהי כן, ויעש אלוהים את חיית הארץ למינה, ואת הבהמה למינה, ואת כל רמס האדמה למינהו, ויאמר אלוהים, או, oh, ויאמר אלוהים <אז> כי טוב. ויאמר אלוהים נעשה אדם בצלמנו כדמותנו וירדו בדגת הים ובעוף השמיים ובבהמה ובכל הארץ ובכל הרמס הרמס על הארץ ויברא אלוהים את האדם בצלמו בצלם אלוהים ברא אותו 
זכרו נקבה ברא אותם, ויברך אותם אלוהים, ויאמר להם אלוהים, פירו ורבו ומילאו את הארץ וכבשוה ורדו בדגת הים ובעוף השמיים ובכל חיית הרומסת על הארץ. ויאמר אלוהים, הנה נתתי לכם את כועסב זורי הזרע אשר על פני כל הארץ ואת כל העץ אשר בו פרי את זורי זרע לכם יהיה לאוכלה ולכל חיית הארץ, ולכל עוף השמיים, ולכל רמס על, על, רמס על הארץ, אשר בו נפש חיה את כל, יר, את כל ירק עשב לאוכלה, ויהי כן. וירא אלוהים את כל אשר עשה, והנה טוב מאוד. ויהי ערב, ויהי בוקר, יום השישי. ויחולו השמיים והארץ וכל צבעם וכל עלי אלוהים ביום השביעי מלאכתו אשר עשה וישפט ביום השביעי מכל מלאכתו אשר עשה ויברך אלוהים את יום השביעי ויקדש אותו כי יבוא שבת וכל מלאכתו אשר ברא אלוהים לעשות. And together, ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר נתן לנו תורת אמת, וחיי עולם נתת בתוכנו, ברוך אתה אדוני, נותן התורה. אמן. Before we uh, continue with the Mishaberach, what I'd like to do, I just want to roll a little bit back onto the Breshit side. So, uh, Steve, if you hold that end, and just hold it loosely. I just want to kind of gather some more so it's not quite as... Uh, could you hold this side, Rebecca? Just kind of... The... Uh, one of the things you'll notice is uh, the, the calligraphy is a very... is a highly stylized calligraphy that uh, they say uh, comes from um, uh, Central Europe. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Torah, I think, is considered to be about a hundred and something uh, years old. And um, there's sort of little things uh, hidden uh, in the calligraphy. Every once in a while, you'll see a pe, which usually is a pretty standard letter there. Every once in a while, there'll be sort of an extra little loop inside, which is a Kabbalistic practice of the scribes. And... Uh, they all kind of wanted to make their own particular... On the, one th the, on the one hand, like the last thing you want to do is, like, this is my Torah. The whole idea is every Torah is the Torah. B uh, but yet there's the pride of calligraphy. It takes about a, an average of about a year and a half to, uh, to actually calligraph a Torah. So you want it to be... Um, there's a little bit of pride of ownership, even though I suppose the whole idea of, cal of calligraphing it is then to sell it to somebody. Put this a little bit more, just so we can have some. Yeah, I don't want to fold any of the parchment. It's yeah, we can we can have the the Torah repaired. Let's now, Steve. Could you sort of catch the? Uh, you can gently pull that up towards you. Ah, good, good. That's good. And let's uh, let's leave it like this for the time. Being. All right. Um, let's see. Let me use this for a minute. Thank you. This is your book, right? 
Oh, was, oh, you want to? That came forward last year, yes. and we've, you know, we've. I, I know Miranda's here, our reader from the last several years, <laughs> and we thank you very much. You did such a great job, and we decided that it was time for. We had so many people that run it, wanted to read Torah that we took this. Torah portion, and we have this strong woman group of readers, which is really exciting. Uh, Rachel White, as you know, ha recently had a loss in her family, and so we want to thank Shuki for stepping up also last minute and filling in for her. So what it was very powerful. I just wanted to say I am kind of have the chills from Absolutely. reading with this group today. In fact, let us bless those who were called to the Torah. Folks, please turn to page 234. If you would rise and join me in reading the English at the bottom of the page. May the one who brought blessings to Abraham and Sarah, to Isaac and Rebecca, to Jacob, Rachel, and Leah, bring blessings to Shuki, Carol, Hazel, Robin, Merle, Susan, Margie. I think you did got I get, us. Did I get a, well, Susan, me. of course. Did I get all of our readers? Did I, I think I, so. Good. Who rose today to honor God, Torah, and the Day of Remembrance. The blessing of safety and protection in time of trouble. The blessing of comfort and healing in time of illness. The blessing of success and fulfillment in all endeavors. On this day of remembrance, inscribe them and all, all Israel for a life of goodness. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. You may go back to your seats. Um, we had someone, it would be a fairly expensive uh, th repairing it. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. Return the Torah. <laughs> hamina, hamina. Uh, so we have the second. Uh, so you know what, let's. Let's return the Torah and then we'll do the shofar. And well, no, I see why we're doing this. Okay, so we're gonna <laughs> we'll do the shofar now. Okay, I think we're good. It's only gonna get worse as we get older, you know. Our service continues on page 267 with the Zichronot Shofar service. We read together the middle of page 267. God of remembrance. Remember the covenant of our ancestors. We reaffirm it today. Remember, we are a people of noble ideals. Help us attain them. Remember all your people, all the nations on the road to peace. Bless their efforts. Remember with mercy the binding of Isaac, the sorrow of Sarah, Abraham's words, here I am. Our memories fades, but, our, but you remember all that we have forgotten. Your presence is a throne where all things matter and nothing is lost. Baruch Ata Adonai, Zocher Habrit. Blessed are you, Adonai. You remember the covenant. You remember us. Please rise. The Kia Shivarim Terua. Tekia, Tekia, Shivarim, Tekia, Tekia, Terua, Tekia. It's 
Folks, if you'll please be seated. Perhaps our speaker will share her credentials with you and her professional life, which is rich and engaging. But as an introduction, to our second day Rosh Hashanah speaker, I would just have to begin by saying that Rachel Segal is probably 
one of the truest examples of a Gutta Nishuma, of a person who possesses a good soul. In Yiddish, a Gutta Nishoma is one that is a good soul. Like, oh, that's good. I mean, a Gutta Nishoma means that it's a person who resonates with a kind of goodness and kindness that you can't help but experience. If you're standing next to her at Stop and Shop, you experience the Gutta Nishoma. She might not let you get in front of her, but she'll... <laughs> but you will know that there is a particular kindness about her that is beautiful and expressive. And as you hear the story she'll tell you today, I mean, there's sharing love and kindness, and there's sharing love and kindness. And um, Rachel's experience is an extraordinary one, and I hope that... Uh, you will find in this story uh, the kind of inspiration that is um, usually like, you know, you hear about it on uh, NPR, you know, on Fridays when they play the story core, and there's an interview between two people, and it's always this just like, and, and I think you really need to, actually, you need to go in and do one of those story core stories uh, with one of the dads, because I think that it would be the perfect story. Anyway, Rachel Segal, would you please come up? Do you want to do on the? Do you want to be on the podium, or do you want to be down here? Okay, why don't you please sit down here? I'll get you some water. Do you? Uh, where'd she go? Oh, well, from the bottle too. Ooh. Getting the private stash. That's you know. I don't know what to tell you. Your, your throat's going to be so clear in two minutes. <laughs> now. It's not on yet. And also, of course, the children and her family uh, have been longtime members of our temple. And um, Rachel and Tony and their kids bring uh, their own kind of uh, wild and crazy excitement and a joy about life and living. And um, I am so honored that you agreed to come and talk to us um, because we just think you're the best. <laughs> okay, Kate, you are now officially on. Okay. Well, I have to say that um, I'm not completely speaking, I think, exactly what he thinks I'm saying, but. That's okay. <laughs> he didn't ask to see it beforehand, so. <clears throat> when asked to speak today about my experience being a gestational carrier, I thought about why it would be interesting to any of you. I considered what about my experience was most important to me and would be relevant to others. As I prepared for today, I let my mind drift over my pregnancies for my friends and considered what about them was meaningful to me. Some people assumed that I was like a big baby person, or alternatively, that I was on a political crusade. The truth is that I'm actually not a huge baby person. As cute as some babies are, I actually really enjoy kids much more when they're at the age where I can communicate with them. And although I have strong political beliefs in equality and rights for all people, I'm not a big political activist. Some people would say to me that I was so altruistic, not drinking while being pregnant and dealing with my stretched out body after carrying more babies. I do enjoy drinking and I don't enjoy trying to get back into shape after pregnancies, but the truth is I don't believe in the term altruism. I don't believe that anything we do is altruistic because we always get something from kind things we do for others. I felt valuable. I felt that I was a part of something important. I felt happy that I could do something that would help people I really care about. And that was good for me, not just good for the dads for whom I carried the babies. I will get to this a little bit more later, but what really motivated me above all was friendship. For those of you who don't know me and my family, I have a husband, Tony, and three amazing healthy children, Maddie, Jordy, and Zeke. It has never been lost on me how incredibly lucky I am in my life. 
I'm grateful that I grew up in a caring Jewish liberal family with access and opportunities. And additionally, that Tony and I were able to conceive easily and that I had easy pregnancies and deliveries, even with Zeke, who weighed in at nine pounds, seven ounces. My awareness about my ease in regard to conception and childbirth was in comparison to heterosexual women who I know often have a great deal of difficulty. When I watched a 60 Minutes or 2020 episode about 12 years ago on gay couples and the expense it is for them to have biological children, especially gay men because they obviously can't carry them, I immediately thought about Tony's and my friend from college, Eric. I loved Eric from the moment that I met him. He's that kind of guy that is charismatic and fun, but also real, someone who you can really talk with. Eric is gay, and as I watched the show, I thought, Eric would be a great dad, and since I have had such an easy time having my kids, I could carry one for him. I felt excited about this idea and called him to tell him my brilliant plan. I think I kind of scared Eric more than anything else at that time. He didn't even have a partner at that point, and I don't think that he had ever really envisioned being a father. He was gay and didn't see that as part of his future. I then slowed down a bit and said, you can just know that I'm here and I'm willing to carry a baby for you if you ever decide that you want one. I think at the time his response was probably something like, uh, okay, thanks, Rachel. So fast forward a few years, Eric meets Sandro, they fall in love, and we start talking for real about the idea of me carrying a baby for them. Luckily, Eric and Sandro had a wonderful relationship with Tony too, and the four of us decided this could work. When this process began, everyone was asking what my kids thought. What was I telling them? And wow, they must have so many questions. <clears throat> the truth is that after Zeke, age seven at the time, learned how the race of the sperm to the egg would work in this non-traditional way, the kids mostly just thought it was really cool. Maddie was excited that we would be more interesting now, not just a typical suburban family anymore. <laughs> I actually wondered if I was missing something for a bit. Was I not asking them enough questions about how they felt? Were they having a hard time that I was unaware of? But no, they loved Eric and Sandro, felt that it made sense that they too should be able to have a child, and were glad that I could help them have one. Now could I just get back to life and play a video game with him or pick them up from rehearsal? I knew I wouldn't be comfortable having it be my egg. So Eric and Sandro got an egg donor and had eggs fertilized by sperm from both of them. After we had started the process, I found out that I would need to get shots twice a week and have blood taken regularly. I historically have hated needles, a fear I apparently inherited from my father, so I wasn't psyched about that part, but I learned to tolerate it. In November of 2009, we went to a clinic in Connecticut to have the embryos transferred into me by an Israeli doctor with incredible blue eyes. I was to go in to get my blood taken to see if I was pregnant two weeks later, but of course I was an impatient and did a home pregnancy test about 10 days later to find out that it was positive. I could go on now and tell you the details of the pregnancy and the one that followed, but what I was most struck by was the connections I felt with people while going through the process. These connections ranged from bumping into someone in Whole Foods who thanked me for what I was doing and told me that he used the article in the tab to talk with his kids about these issues, to Elaine, the awesome woman at Quest who took my blood each week so, so well, <laughs> uh, and we talked about our kids together, to Bev Holzman here at the temple who made sweaters for both of the kids that I had for Eric and Sandro. I was blown away by the outpouring of support. And that isn't even speaking about the deeper connections I formed with Eric and Sandro, Tony, and the rest of my family, who all embraced the process. The only time I hit a truly hard moment in being a gestational carrier was with my parents when I decided to do it a third time for another gay couple, John and Nikolai. I had met John through Eric and Sandro and again felt an immediate connection. Fast forward a few years, he meets Nikolai, falls in love, and over New Year's going into 2015, they asked me if I would consider carrying a baby for them. It had been three years since I had given birth to the second child for Eric and Sandro, but with some thought, discussion with Tony, and conversations with Eric and Sandro to make sure they too were on board, I decided that I would like to do this a third and last time. My parents were not happy. <laughs> 
They didn't know John and Nikolai well, but assumed that they were very nice people. That wasn't the issue. I was now 45. They were worried that I was getting older and were concerned about the what-ifs regarding my health. As I mentioned earlier, my good fortune in life is not lost on me. Not only have I been extremely lucky in terms of having babies in very uncomplicated, easy ways, I'm also aware of how lucky I am that I've had extremely close relationships with my parents, generally filled with a lot of agreement on important things and lots of love and support. This was the first time I was facing an important issue on which we really disagreed, and it was tense. I found myself thinking about not doing it, even though I really felt good about it, because my parents were so concerned and upset with me about it. And then it hit me so hard. I'm 45 years old, and I'm thinking about not doing something I believe in because my mom and dad don't like it. <laughs> I knew that I needed to grow up, let my values lead me, believe in myself, and believe that my parents would hang in there. Long story short, I did it. John and Nikolai are proud fathers of twin one-and-a-half-year-old girls, and my parents and I got through it, repairing after difficult conversations and remaining incredibly close. So let me get back to why choosing to be a gestational carrier for my friends was so meaningful to me and why I thought my talking today could be interesting and relevant to you. As I am sure some of you know, for the past while, Ron Fellman has been walking around asking people what they think is the meaning of life. When he asked me a year or two ago, I'm quite sure I answered quickly with something about relationships. Whenever I think about what is really important to me, what guides my values and my way of living, it is always about connection with others. And I know that the times I feel the best are when I am talking, listening, laughing, crying, and growing with those I care about. The relationships I have with others feed me, and the idea of being able to lean on others and have them lean on me is what I know drives me. I've been a therapist for years, but I didn't feel settled in it until about five years ago when I started doing couples therapy. This modality feels so right for me, though quite challenging at times, I find it to be incredibly fulfilling to help people hear each other and work to create greater care, humor, and connection with one another, a sense that they matter and can turn toward each other. When I was pregnant with Rachel Maria, the first child I carried for my friends, I came here to Temple to hear Sasha Chanoff speak. He is the founder and director of an organization that helps get refugees out of Africa and resettles them here into homes where they can be safe and live new lives. I was blown away. He was, and still is, doing incredible work. I was so humbled. I was getting all of these accolades for carrying a baby for my friends, and suddenly I felt so small and ridiculous for having felt proud of what I was doing. It felt minuscule in comparison to what this guy was doing. He was saving lives. He'd probably saved thousands of lives. I went home and thought, what am I doing? Yes, I'm having a baby for my friends. I know it will be nice for them, blah, 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 but I'm not going into Africa and saving lives. It took me a while to process all of my feelings. After some time, I got it, and after a bit more time, I was able to feel proud again. It is like the old story about Zusha, the Hasidic master. In a nutshell, as he is getting ready to die, he worries that God will be upset with him not because he wasn't more like Moses or anyone else, but because he wasn't more like himself. He wasn't always true to himself, and that was what he knew was most important, not that he'd be like someone else. When I remember that story, I try to stop comparing myself and just think about what I can do to be a positive force in the world. As much as I find that helpful to keep in mind, and I really do, I also believe strongly that thinking about ways that other people do things can be really useful and inspiring. A few days ago, sorry, I just wanted to make sure, yeah. <laughs> a few days ago, my son Zeke was having a hard time after they were learning about eugenics in history class. For those of you that don't remember what eugenics is, it is the science of improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable, heritable characteristics. Eugenics programs are often thought of in relation to the Nazis, but it was practiced in the U.S. and other countries many years before. Zeke was feeling overwhelmed by the terrible things that people do in the world. I get it. To look at a history book or to just listen to the news, there's a lot of upsetting stuff out there, 
that can make us wonder what is wrong with everyone. However, what I want to say to Zeke and to all of us is that we need to look around for the good, kind, caring things people are out there doing in the world on a daily basis in big and small ways. I see the way that Amy Jean is so non-judgmental of everyone she meets. I see Susan Reddick's humor and her joy, not only when she accomplishes something, but also so much so also when those around her who she knows and cares about do too. I see Karen and Rich Blacker giving teenagers a chance to get work experience and learn how it feels to have responsibility and earn money. And I see the way that Debbie Fellman embraces wholeheartedly other people's children, including mine, always supportive in good times and hard times. I put these people, as well as so many others, and honestly, including so many of you in this room that I know, and I, when I look around, I think, oh my God, I didn't say Elise. Oh my God, I didn't say Bunny. You know, I mean, there's, everybody's doing really great things, Stacy. I mean, just so many people doing such good in the world. So I put all of these people that I know well and don't know at all into a similar category as Sasha Chanoff. They are people who I can learn from, who bring good into the world. They give me hope. I also know that I don't have to do things exactly the way they do. Maybe at some point in my life, it will make sense for me to go to Africa and help people there. But for now, between my life and my work here, that doesn't make sense for me. I can be here, being a therapist, raising my kids, having babies for my friends, and continuing to work to be my best self as much as, of the time as I can. When in a moment of doubt, I can think about what might any of them do, or what would Tony do with his way of responding with care and integrity, or any of the other many people I admire and respect. I even heard a story recently about an eighth grade girl whose teacher wrote a comment about her in which she talked about the girl's incredible attitude. She said that if this girl had to deal with a pile of manure, she'd say something like, well, it's actually really good because it helps plants grow and there might be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> that inspired me. As do many people like Maureen, the crossing guard at Mason Rice Elementary School, who has, who has an amazing sense of humor and warmly greeted kids and parents by name for over 40 years. And the guy at the UPS store in Newtonville, who is friendly and helpful and just seems to be a genuinely good guy who enjoys his job. As I go into this new year, I believe that my work is to be the best Rachel I can be. I know that taking in what I can learn from those around me helps me, but that ultimately I need to check in with myself about what really matters to me, what are my values, and then I need to practice living by them. I know that relationships and strong connections where people know that they can count on me and that we really matter to each other are at the core of what is meaningful to me. That is really why I chose to be a gestational carrier and really why I do most of what I do. I might not be saving lives in Africa, but I'm doing things that I can feel good about here. I'm always struck at the, end, at the ending of the show Pippin when he realizes that he doesn't have to be extraordinary, that he can just be himself and live a smaller but meaningful life. I want to get up and cheer for him because it feels so important that he figured things out for himself and maybe also because he chose what feels most meaningful to me too. I want to end with two quotes. The first is one that my daughter Jordy read at the end of a speech she gave at school a couple of weeks ago, and I loved it. I love it because it helps us all work to be ourselves and do what works for each of us. It encourages us to not shy away from our strengths and our ability to put ourselves out there and contribute. It is a quote by Mary Ann Williamson who says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. It's not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. The second quote and last thing I want to end on is by Brene Brown, who if you don't know, you should go home and Google her because she's incredibly smart, funny, and she just makes a ton of sense. 
She talks about connecting deeply through vulnerability, not having to be perfect, finding true belonging, and despite the fact that we as humans have a bias toward focusing on the negative, we can choose to focus more on the good. As we go into this new year, I find these words of hers particularly inspiring. She says, I don't have to chase extraordinary moments to find happiness. It's, in right, it's right in front of me if I'm paying attention and practicing gratitude. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to do that.
for these who have died in recent days and weeks. Richard Goyak, Sylvia Kaufman, Jerry Michelson, Herbert Bernard Safran, Steve White. The memories of all of them are with us, as are the names of all loved ones and friends. And we turn to page 292. Yit gadal v'yit gadash shemei rabah v'yalma divra chirutei v'yamlich malchutei v'chayichon v'yom eichon v'chayye d'chol b'yit Yisrael v'agala v'yizman kari v'yimru amen yehei shmei rabah mevorach li'olam me'olmei almaya yit barach v'yishtabach v'yit pa'ar v'yit romam v'yit nasei Viet Hadar, Viet Ale, Viet Alal, Shemeda Kutsha, Brichu, Leilao, Leila, Mikobir Chata, Vishirata, Tushpechata, Venechemata, Da Amiran, Vialma, Vimru Amen, Yehe, Shlama, Rabba, Min Shamaya, the Chaim Alenu, Viel, Kol Yisrael, Vimru Amen, O say Shalom, Bimromav, Huya, a say Shalom, Alenu, Viel, Kol Yisrael, Viel, Kol Yoshve, Tevel, Vimru, Amen. And now, if you'll please turn back to page 284. Did you read? Okay. We read the blessing at the top of 284. Baruch Ata Adonai, Shomea Kol Truat Amo Yisrael Berachamim. Blessed are you in our lives, Adonai. You hear with love the shofar, true voice of your people, Israel. Tekia, shivarim teruwa, tekia, tekia, shivarim, tekia. Tekia, Terua, Tekia Gedola, Before we say Shana Tova, we do the motzi so you can go out there and you can enjoy. And so, if you will. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam Hamotzi lechem min aretz Amen. Folks, on this second day of the new year, may you have an extraordinary beginning, middle, and end to this year. May it be one where you find excitement and joy and wholeness. May it be one that we feel we have the power and the ability to discern how each of us in our own way, as Rachel has taught us, can find how we make a difference. Someone else's way is their way. It's up to us, each of us, to find ours. May God's presence enable us to do so. Shana Tov, everybody. Shana Tova. Sweet New Year.